Okay, we are back in the book of Mark. We are in the book of Mark. We have made it to chapter 8. Again, we are moving slowly, slowly but surely. And we've been kind of just reading it and discovering what God wants to show us. And ultimately, our purpose in this is, as I've said before, we don't just want to learn things about Jesus. We want to learn so that we can obey him and become like him. Become like him in the way he lived. Become like him in his disciplines. Become like him in his heart and his attitudes. And become like him in the way he ministered to other people. That's what it means to be a disciple. So let's continue on today. And we're going to flip to Mark 8. So if you have your Bibles, flip to Mark 8, verse 34 to 38. Mark 8, 34 to 38. All right. So at this point in the Gospels, Jesus has been uh, journeying with his disciples. And at this point, he has basically told his disciples very clearly, I'm about to die. I'm about to be handed over and killed. And then I'm going to be raised to life. He says it very explicitly to them at this point. So if you know the story, one of his disciples, Peter, comes up to him and says, Jesus, we're never going to let this happen to you. Like, we're not going to let you die and be killed. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. So it's at this point where Jesus says this uh, passage here. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. It says it daily in, the, in Luke's version of this. They must take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their soul will lose it, but whoever loses their soul for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can someone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus comes and brings a heavy truth to us. He comes and speaks by the fire of the Holy Spirit here. So we've been talking, as I said, we've been talking about imitating Christ. And so far, we've covered private prayer. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about the importance of having a pure heart. We've talked about faith. These are all, so far it's been kind of cushy, hasn't it? It's been pretty simple. And this is where it gets real. This is where Jesus gets real with us and says, if you want to follow me, you have to be all in. You have to give up everything. And that means just as I'm about to go die on the cross, you have to be willing to to pick up your cross and follow me. You have to be willing to go to that place. I'm not interested in you just being, being a fan of me. I'm interested in you dying to yourself and coming and following me wholeheartedly. So there's a few pieces in this passage that I want to focus on this morning. The first is the idea of, oh, I forgot to go through these. The first idea is this idea of worldliness. Jesus says, what good is it for you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? So this idea of wor the world, worldliness, is, is a, a word that's often used in the scriptures, and it's often used to describe worldly ways of thinking, worldly actions, worldly attitudes, um, basically um, ways of thinking that are opposed to the kingdom of God. So if we think about our world, our world struggles with all sorts of things and does all sorts of things that, are, that run in opposition to the kingdom of God. So that's what Jesus is talking about when he speaks of the world. There's another verse that speaks quite clearly on this, and it's 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17. John says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world... Love for the Father is not in them. That's a very strong statement. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. 
The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So this is a very strong statement, isn't it? Do you guys feel that? Am I the only one? It's a strong statement. It it poses a very strong dichotomy. There's the ways of the world and there's the ways of God. Don't love the world. If you love the world and the ways of the world, love for God is not in you. I think this reminds me of when Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. They're mutually exclusive. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve the world and also serve God at the same time. So the Bible speaks very strongly about this, very strongly. And I don't think we should downplay this dichotomy. We should really uphold this truth that things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the attitudes of this world are things that we need to reject strongly. So I, I want to ask you, as we read this passage, you can look at it here. What, does John, what do you think John means when he says the world? Uh, you feel free to answer. What does he mean when he says the world? Or when he says the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? What are some examples in your mind of what he's referencing? Values? Of the world. Values? Any specific ones that come to your mind? Financial wealth, yeah, pursuit of wealth. Anything else that comes to mind? What, what do you think of when you read this passage? What jumps into your mind, yeah? Greed, Greed. yep. Yeah. Anything else? What are worldly lusts of the flesh and lusts of the eyes, the pride of life? What is that? Are there any other examples that you can think of? Putting self first, yeah. In any specific ways that you're... (laughs) Sorry, I'm getting to the specifics here. What are examples of when we put ourselves first? Not caring about the needs of others. Not caring about the needs of others, yeah, for sure. Putting our own needs above. Status. Status, yeah. Wanting power. There's... Sorry? Ego. Ego, yeah. Yeah. These are all about about elevating ourselves, And it's not bad. There's people in scripture who had lots of power, that God gave them lots of power. Um, But that's not bad in itself. It's that when we're pursuing our own needs and our own ego and our own power um, above above God's. Yeah? Pornography. Pornography, yeah. That's a very literal lust. People lust after. Not willing to recognize that God is God, yeah? Yeah, these are all great examples of of worldly ways of thinking. Love of money is a huge one. Jesus talks about money almost more than, I think he does more than any other topic, about the love of money. I think he just walked around and saw that so many people were motivated, like all of their motivations were driven by money, by a love for money. That's pretty strong in our culture. It's pretty strong in the Western world this love of money. There's another one that always hits me when Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I think all of us store up treasures on earth. We have so many physical possessions that we value so much, and if we lost them, we would be devastated. Yeah, Nate? I think that might also mean like mental treasures. Mental treasures too, yeah, for sure. Yeah, don't store up things in your mind, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, and th- it's possible for even, even good things in our life can become idols. Even our family can become idols. I've seen people that are, their whole lives are revolved around wanting their kid to be an NHL superstar. That's the, it dri- it's what drives them. It's what gives them purpose and meaning. And that's not the way God calls us to live. He doesn't call us to to elevate our our family above him. So are there things in your life that you obsess about that are worldly? You don't have to share that out loud. (laughs) You can if you want. 
But are there things that you know that God is calling you to, to remove from your life or attitudes you have that you know are not from him? God wants, again, he wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. Okay, after I've said all of this about the world, I want us to be very careful that we have a healthy theology of the world. Because lots of people throughout history have read these passages and said, okay, as Christians, we need to isolate ourselves and start our own communities, live in a little bubble, and not associate with other people who are non-Christians. That's not what God is calling us to do. And he's not calling us to look at people in the world and say, you're all evil, and speak about them in judgment. That's not what he's calling us to do. So it's easy when we meditate on these passages and reflect on them to start thinking this way and start thinking everything out there is horrible. I never want to go out in the world. But that is not what God calls us to. Jesus calls us the light of the world, which means we're supposed to be going into the world. And when in there's places where it's dark, there's places where people are suffering. There's places where people are, uh, there's so much darkness and we're called to, to be light in those areas. So, so as believers, we need to have a strong, very strong resistance against worldly ideas and passions and pleasures, but a strong love towards worldly people. A strong resistance against worldly ideas, but a strong love towards worldly people. This is very hard to get right. It's very hard to get this balance right. But I'm going to read a story where we will see this modeled perfectly. Obviously, it's in the life of Jesus, <laughs> if you couldn't guess. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, which was wrong. It's wrong for her to commit adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, commanded us, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? That is the ultimate test of a rabbi who's following the Old Testament scriptures. That is the ultimate test. This is what the word says. Here's the example. What are you going to do about it? And Jesus, they were using this as a trap to have a basis for accusing him. And Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. I wish we knew what he wrote down, but we don't know. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. <clears throat> Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Isn't this a powerful story? I almost get emotional every time I read this one. This is the perfect story perfect balance of Jesus upholding the truth that adultery is wrong. He never says adultery is okay. It's all good that you sinned. Uh, it's okay that you're breaking up your marriage. He never said that. But he offered grace to this woman. He offered God's grace and said, I forgive you for this. Now don't do this anymore. Leave your life of sin. Isn't this the perfect balance of God's love, his grace, and him still firmly rejecting the ways of the world. Firmly rejecting the ways of the world. Again, this is very hard. <laughs> I want to say for us, as imperfect people, this is very hard to get right. I've, I was recently watching a video of someone who was going out on the streets and evangelizing and bringing Jesus to people. And... The way he was doing it, he was calling people sinners, which, which is true. <laughs> he was speaking truth, but he was saying, you are all sinners, you're all under judgment. And the tone and the nature of what he was doing was judgment, was judgment. 
It was heavy. It was pointing the finger at people. And he may have been, like all of the things he was speaking were true, but it wasn't done from that posture of love and that posture of grace. It has to be done from the posture of grace. This is very hard to get right. Has anyone encountered someone in their life who they, you know was doing something wrong and you thought, how do I talk to them about this? Anyone had that? Or you know someone, you're like, what they're doing is so harmful, but how do I communicate with, this in, that, with them in a way that they're going to be drawn away from their sin, but they're also going to feel love and grace? Very, very hard to do. Very hard to do. But I think, personally, I think one of the ways that we can develop this posture is by praying for people first. If we ever see someone sinning and we're going to confront them, pray for them first so that you know you're not coming from a place of judgment towards them. Pray for them to be removed from their sin and pray blessings over them. All right. So remember, we need a strong resistance, very strong resistance against worldly ideas, but a very strong love towards worldly people. The next part of this this first passage we read that Jesus shared with us is the denying the self. We are called to deny ourself. What does it mean to deny? I'll open that up again. What does it mean to deny yourself? What does that mean? Deny your existence? Say, I don't exist? No, that's not it. Your urges? Yeah, denying your urges. Yeah, what else? Oh, Julian, yeah. Denying your fleshly desires. Any specific ones? I guess similar to what we were talking about before. Yeah. 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 I looked up a definition of this in a concordance, and it says, to forget oneself, to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. So to to notice what are the things that are my interests, I'm going to lose sight of those and put Jesus's interests first. That is really what self-denial is. I was watching, um, some of you may know John Wimber. He's a a well-known pastor. I was watching his testimony. He was sharing his story. And if you don't know, he was in a, he was in a band called the Righteous Brothers. Anyone know the Righteous Brothers or know any of their songs? Yeah. I think it was before my time, but I don't want to make you, any of you feel old. <laughs> so I didn't know them, but, but they were pretty well known. And he was on the path to success. He was already living in success as a famous artist, musical artist. How many people dream of that as, a, as young kids to become a famous musician? You can have whatever you want. You can have all the money and all the income you want, all the status, all the power. People love you. And he was already living that life. And he said, he came to a point in his life where God said, you have to give that up. You have to give that up totally. And he gave up that life of fame, success. That's like the peak of worldly pleasures. The peak of worldly desires is to be famous, to be a famous musician. And he denied that and said, Jesus, I want to serve you first. And as we know, God used him in in some very powerful ways, but that's such a good picture of self-denial. He was, he, music's not wrong. Living and having success is not wrong. But he recognized that he was doing this in a way that was self-motivated, and he gave that up. That is powerful self-rejection. Very powerful. Self-denial. I like to think of, when I think about self-denial, the, this image came to my mind. If it's if it will come on the screen. The image came to my mind of driving a car. Who likes to be in the driver's seat when they're in a car? Anyone like to be passengers and you don't like to drive? Okay, some of you. <laughs> That's fine. I, I have days like that. Usually I like to be the one who's driving because I'm in full control. I don't know about you, but some people's driving really makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, he's, new, he's new. Give him a break. 
some people really follow really closely to other cars and like if they put the brakes on we're going to smash into them or some people what else do people do uh some people wait longer to brake than i do they they pull really close to a person and then they slam on the brakes and i'm like i'm gonna have a heart attack so i don't like i don't like being a passenger i like being the driver and when i'm a driver i have full control over where we go so often in my family we'll drive by this place that has this big yellow m <laughs> mcdonald's drive by mcdonald's and everyone will want to go there and i'm in full control i can say nope we're not going there we're not going there so i like having that that control that power sorry i'm power hungry uh, but uh sorry i'm lost here so as christians i think i thought of this as an example for our faith with god we often invite jesus into the car with us and say jesus we're going to go about our day today come with me come join me on my day today and he's sitting in the passenger seat and as we're driving um jesus says well the, why don't you turn right here and that person that really hurt you um, why don't you forgive them and reach out to them and try to make things right and we say that's a pretty interesting suggestion but i think i'm going to go left i don't really like that today i don't feel like it today maybe i'll do it another time or jesus says hey look there's a nice pit stop really nice area green grass why don't we just spend some time together and we can pull off and have a rest and we say jesus didn't you see don't you know that i have have to get to this place on time I have all these things I have to do. Um, I don't have time for that. We don't talk to God like this <laughs> verbally, but sometimes in our hearts, we know he's prompting us to do something. And we say, God, I'm, I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. This is what it's like. And I think this example is actually pretty, I think it's a pretty good example because we can actually talk to the Holy Spirit. We can actually communicate with him day to day in our day to day lives. And there's moments, we have to pay attention to those moments where, where we're going on a path and there's another suggestion in our spirit that we should go this way or we should do something different. Those are oftentimes the Holy Spirit is, is gently pushing us in a different direction. And so we have to be very attentive to those moments and follow the leading of the Spirit. This is a daily decision. This we're basically taking ourselves out of the driver's seat and saying, Jesus, I want you to drive wherever you tell me to go. Or we're driving and Jesus, wherever he tells us to go, we say, okay, I trust you. I trust that your path is better than mine. It's a daily decision we have to make to get up in the morning and say, Jesus, I'm putting you in the driver's seat of my life today as I wake up. I'm, tr I'm following you today. I'm dying to myself. That has to, we have to do it every day. And sometimes praying that is really helpful. God, you're in control today. I'm setting myself behind your leadership. So true life, true life in Christ is costly. It costs us our whole self. It costs us our whole identity it has to be given to Christ and submitted to him. Everything that we are, we have to lay it at his feet and say, God, I want your identity. I don't want my own identity. I want you. I want your identity to live through me. It's so costly following Christ. It costs everything. But the reward is so much higher, isn't it? Does anyone feel that this morning? Do you feel that the reward of following Christ is so much higher than the cost of giving everything to him? He, he offers us new abundant life in him there's a quote i've probably done i've probably quoted this in church many times before because it's such a good quote but there's a guy named dietrich bonhoeffer who was a german theologian who lived during nazi germany and while he was living he noticed that the church really struggled with apathy and complacency people were just kind of going through the motions there wasn't a lot of zeal and passion for God and he Bonhoeffer kind of diagnosed this problem he says I think I know what it is 
And he calls this cheap grace, this idea of cheap grace. So listen to this quote. I'm going to read it slowly. It's a powerful one. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus living. Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Oh, I went too far here. Uh, Rob, can you go to the second one? <laughs> okay. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ, at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Can you do the slides, Rob? Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God so much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. Isn't that an amazing writing? That's so strong, so powerful, costly grace. How often have we made grace so cheap? We say, just say this prayer and you're all good. There's a little bit of truth in that, but, but Jesus calls us to give him everything, everything we have to submit our lives to him. When we're living our daily day-to-day -day lives to be submitted to him, not just saved in the past, Submitted to him each day in all that we do. Everything we do, Lord. Lord, we want to commit everything we do to you. I, are we living with a cheap grace? I think in many ways we are. If you go to other countries and you see Christians in other countries, people are willing to die to deliver Bibles to other people. People are willing to die to share the gospel with their friends in many countries around the world. They're willing to give up, literally take this passage and say, God, I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to, I'm going to follow you. People are willing to do that. And how often are we afraid to just talk about Jesus and bring up the name of Jesus in a conversation? Because we're afraid of being labeled as weird or la labeled as a crazy, crazy Christian. How often are we afraid and we're living with a cheap kind of grace with a lack of zeal or how long, how often are we afraid to stand up for what's right in our country and in our in our city because we're afraid of being labeled a radical the views of christianity are going to become labeled more and more as radical views whether we like it or not there's there's even laws in place right now that could get christians jailed right now in Canada. There's laws. If, if I pray with someone and counsel someone about their sexuality, I could be jailed. I could be put in jail for that. So there's already laws in place that are opposed to the Christian message. And, and are, we willing to, are we willing to go to jail for the gospel? Are we willing to be persecuted for the gospel? God, I think, is shaking us up. I think he's shaking up our nation. And he's making it more difficult for us to just be docile Christians or to be passive Christians.
Christians. So are we all in with Christ? Are we dead to ourselves? Where's our heart for the lost? Where's our heart for people who are far from Christ? Why is that not our sole motivation as believers to go and win people to Christ? Why have we lost that? Why have we lost that? We need to rekindle that flame, that love for God, that he's our first priority. His kingdom is our first priority. All that we do is surrounded in, by him, is for him. So I want to close with that challenge that if you're feeling like there's parts of yourself or there's parts of your heart that's not dead to yourself, parts of you that are, you're holding on to, that you're maybe afraid of what people will think or you're, there's a part of your life you know is worldly, I want to just invite you as we pray, I'm going to invite the worship team back up and we'll, we'll play a song and you're welcome to come up and pray and rededicate yourself to God rededicate yourself to him. You can come to the front or you can stand and pray, but rededicate yourself to him. There's no time to waste. Worship team, you can come up. <laughs> There's no time to waste. We don't, we shouldn't delay in the things God's calling us to do. God wants his church to be full of his zeal, his zeal. Paul says, don't be lacking in zeal. And in so many ways, we struggle with that. So I invite you this morning, I'll just say a prayer and then let's worship together. And if you want prayer, you're welcome to come to the front. So Lord, we thank you that you've called us into new life, into good life, God. And that dying to ourselves is beautiful because we get to live for you and your goodness lives through us, Lord. We thank you that you've offered the only true source of salvation for us. The only true way that we can become good and can become holy. Jesus, that's all through you. And Lord, I repent on behalf of all of us, Lord, in the ways that we're not motivated by you, in the ways that we're worldly, in the ways we think. The things that we do, God, we're, we are worldly. We've made so many mistakes, God. We've lost our sight of you being the sole purpose of all that we do. God, I repent of that. I repent of our lack of, of zeal towards going and making new disciples and winning people to you. God, I repent of that. Make us a church that's dead to ourself. Lord, kill off our flesh, kill off our self, our ego, our own desires. God, we submit those to you. Kill those off in us. And Lord, let your spirit move through us and, and speak to us. God, let your spirit lead us. So I dedicate all of us to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.